I would like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Exodus as we continue on our series. And today I am going to be reading from Exodus chapter 4, verses 18 down to 31. Exodus 4, 18 to 31. I'll give you a moment to find that. And then I'll read God's word for you. This is the word of the one true and living God. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please, let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and he met him at the mountain of God and he kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words the Lord with which he had him sent to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in sight of the people, and the people believed. And when they had heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we we thank you for your, your presence that is ever with us, Lord. We gather this day, Lord, as a body to worship you for what you have done for us in Christ. We come and gather together now, Lord, to exalt above all things your name and your word. Help us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, our passage today may, upon your first reading, seem like a bit of a theological uh, smorgasbord. You know, any time you approach a smorgasbord, You have only one plate to fill with food, and it can be hard to choose the delights that you're going to fill your plate with and what ones you're going to leave until you come back up for a second helping. And it became apparent to me this week that the text division I had made, verses 18 to 31, was, well, it was too big for my plate, so to speak, and that I I risked doing an awful injustice to this text by rushing through this passage this morning just for the sake of finishing the chapter today. I don't want to do that. I don't want to rush our time in this passage of Scripture, I want us to grasp the incredible truths that are found in this passage. And so this morning's sermon is not going to get through all of Exodus 4, 18 to 31. We're going to look at the second half next week. But over the next two Sundays, there are three themes I want us to really hone in on as a church. The first theme and the only theme that we're going to look at today is found in verses 18 to 23. And that theme is the is God's assurance in life's upheaval. And I'll say that again. The theme for this morning is God's assurance in life's upheaval. These five verses, 18 to 23, deliver to us some of the most vital truths about God, truths that have a monumental impact on how we actually live our lives. The other two themes that we'll look at together next week are are warnings for disobedience that comes right after and the worship that we have in our great Savior. You know, they are themes for life. They are truths for daily living. They are realities about God that arm the Christian with assurance and with 
wisdom and with worship. But let's look now in further detail at Exodus chapter 4, verses 18 to 23, and see the assurance that God gives Moses in life's upheaval. You know, what is assurance? Assurance is a positive declaration intended to give confidence. It's, it's a promise. And Scripture is packed to the brim with God's promises, intended to give confidence to those whom He loves and has called into His kingdom through faith in His Son. And there are really too many promises in Scripture to mention this morning. It's packed with them. But, but one such promise that, that God gives His people is found in 1 Samuel 12, uh, verses 22, a beautiful promise of God. The Lord will not forsake His people for His great namesakes, because it has pleased the Lord to make you His people. Wonderful. You know, this was given in the context of the people of Israel at a time whenever they needed assurance that they would not be abandoned. God delivered this promise to the people of Israel when as a nation they were at their lowest points, when they were at one of their most rebellious and unfaithful moments in history. And in that moment, God emphatically declares through Samuel the prophet that He would never abandon His people. Never. He would not abandon His people for the sake of His name. You know, these promises, they keep us afloat through some of the most tumultuous times of our lives as believers. And God's promises given to Moses that we're going to look at here were vital to him becoming obedient to the call of God. You know, uh, Moses has already asked God in this chapter by way of context, what if they don't believe me, God? And God replied, they will believe you because I will give you signs and power. I'm the prime mover here. But I can't speak eloquently, Moses declared. God replied, I will be with your mouth and teach you what to speak. But you know, even with the promise that God would empower Moses, Moses was so afraid that he finally asked God earlier on in chapter 4, send someone else, please, Lord. And in verse 14, God was greatly displeased that Moses continued to doubt, but in his grace, God does send someone else, but not to replace Moses, rather to help him. It was Moses' brother Aaron. And the Lord gave Moses the promise in verse 15, you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth in his mouth, and will teach you both what to do. You see, there is no greater assurance in life than a promise of I will coming out of the mouth of the great I am. You know, we can trace promises of God that are fulfilled all the way through Genesis to now, all the way through history, and realize that everything God promises comes true. There is no one more trustworthy than God. There is no word more trustworthy than the Word of God which we have before us in the Bible. And Moses drew strength from the promises of God's Word, just as we're called to trust in the promises of His Word. And two things we see provided to Moses during a time of great upheaval in his life, as we're about to see, are found in verses 18 to 19, and they are God's assurance in the circumstances and the timing of Moses' life. That's what he's provided, God's assurance in the circumstances and the timings of his life. Notice in verse 18, God opens the door for Moses. He frees him up to serve him. He makes straight his path. He gives him further assurance through his circumstances because Moses comes back to Jethro. A few days must have passed for Moses to have made the journey back to Midian. And I wonder what that journey was like for Moses. I wonder was he worried how Jethro, his employer, and his father-in-law would react to his sudden resignation and departure with his family. You know, as believers, we experience all kinds of concerns, even when we're no, we know that we're walking in, in the will of God. But evidently, God in His sovereignty took care of everything that was required in Moses' circumstance to free him up to do His will. Because when Moses asks in verse 18, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive, Jethro's response is a green light. He actually gives him a blessing he says, go in peace, Moses. 
You know, it reminds us of the psalmist's words in Psalm 37, 23. The steps of a man are established by the Lord uh, when he delights in his way. You see, it seems to be in our nature to worry as humans, doesn't it? There was a statistic I read a few years ago that was doing the rounds that 85% of what we worry about never actually happens. I don't know how much weight you can place on that statistic, to be honest, but I do know it points to the truth that humans worry about a lot of things, a lot of things, and believers are not immune to that worry. But the difference in our lives is that Christians are equipped with the assurance that our steps in life are not accidental, but rather they're known and established by God. The detail in the text here may appear minor, but it isn't minor. It points us to the massive truth that God's sovereignty works through the circumstances of our lives to bring about His purposes. That's what verse 18 tells us, and it it is a great comfort to know that our circumstances are held firmly in the realm of God's sovereign hand. You know, Jerry Bridges, he wrote a powerful book in 1988 uh, called Trusting God, and he touches on this. He said, if God is not sovereign in the decisions and actions of other people as they affect us, then there is a whole major area of our lives where we cannot trust God, where we are left, so to speak, to fend for ourselves. You see, just to know that God knows is deep assurance for the believer. And just as God was working in the circumstances of Moses' life, We worship God knowing that He will accomplish His will in our lives, in every circumstance, good and bad. God has a purpose in His good plan for us if we're believers. And whenever we come to verse 19, we're further comforted by seeing God's timing in every circumstance is always perfect. His timing is perfect. Because in verse 19, Moses is told exactly when to leave. God says, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. You know, there was a practical importance to the timing of God's will. Moses' exile for 40 years in Midian was not a mistake on God's part. It was ordained by him. Moses could not have returned any sooner because it would have imperiled his life. I know sometimes it really does take us to go through something, to see God's perfect timing in hindsight. You know, I wonder if Moses spent any of the 40 years in Midian wrestling for answers about the mistakes of his life in Egypt, asking why things turned out the way they did. You know, I'm sure many of us do the same regarding things in our own lives. But building on the assurance we find in God's promises and in his sovereign hand over our circumstances, we can rest without all the answers, knowing that Scripture points time and time again to the perfect timing of God in our lives. You know, one of my favorite verses that that helps me rest in God's timing when I can't fully understand and need to trust Him is found in Galatians 4. Paul writes, but when the fullness of time had come, in the perfect timing, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. That verse has given me deep comfort across a wide spectrum of difficulties in my life. Because if God's timing is perfect in the biggest moment in history, in the, most impo- in, the mo- in the moment when He sends His only begotten Son into the world to save us, then I trust that every other moment in life, in every moment, God's timing is perfect. And whether or not I understand why God has allowed this situation or that, I know that His Word tells me that He's sovereign over the timing of every circumstance in our lives. That's enough for me. You know, there's a wonderful hymn. It's actually a modern hymn. It was released in 2018 by Bob Coughlin and Sovereign Grace Music, and it breaks me nearly every time I listen to it because it contains such an affirmation of this wonderful truth. The words go as follow. Whate'er my God ordains is right. His holy will abideth. I will be still whatever he does, and follow where he guideth. He is my God, though dark my road. 
He holds me that I shall not fall, and so to him I leave it all, and so to him I leave it all. You know, those are words for uncertain times. Those are words for uncomfortable times for every believer in Christ. Walking in the will of God does not mean our lives will be easy. But it does mean our lives will be kept by a good God who works all things for his glory. And as we come to verses 20 to 21, I think of Moses here. The words of that hymn so applicable to where his heart must have been in that moment. Because verse 20 is a major moment in Moses' life. One I believe, actually many of you in this congregation can relate to on some level at present in your life. Because next we see that, that God gives his continual assurance during times of uncertainty. Look specifically at verse 20. How much memories are packed into that verse? You know, Moses took his wife and his sons, and he had them ride on a donkey. And they went back to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the staff of God in his hand. You know, what discomfort and uncertainty is bursting out of this verse? Moses and Zipporah packed what they could you know, clothes for the children, food for the journey, savings to sustain them along the way and pay for lodging. And everything they had built in Midian for 40 years they left behind. Land, property, furniture, a loving family that they were very close to and connected with. And they didn't know when or if they would ever see them again. But these verses are continually peppered with the comforting words of an assuring God. Because then the Lord says to Moses, Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. You know, the Hebrew is more comforting, I find. It expresses this idea that God is just bringing to Moses' remembrance that this is all you need to do is what God has said, and God will empower him for the work. He's assured. And these tender reassurances of God come to Moses at the perfect time. Imagine how Moses and his family must have felt as they left the gates of their home, not, not knowing the return date. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? It's uncertain. And you know, it seems that it is a plain fact of life that the only constant is change. Life is so transient. Change lurched around every single corner. Last week, uh, the students among us went back to school even if it's the same school, the work is a little bit harder. Expectations increase. Some of you did not go back to your old school, but joined a new school entirely, leaving behind friends and familiar settings. Some have entered university, and it seems in university the future is constantly on your mind. It's constantly robbing you of the present. Pressure amounts because all of a sudden every choice you make now has a cost. It will come at the expense of doing something else. And some of you have jobs where the demands seem to be getting greater, but your stamina to meet those demands lessens with every year. Some of you recently find yourself in the uncomfortable place where you're without a job, and it feels like your security is slipping from beneath you. And some of you are retirees struggling to know how best to use this time of life. Some are struggling and suffering with illness and disease, not sure of what the future holds. I know some of you are suffering intensely with the abruptness that comes with bereavement. Suffering with a new norm that's left you with a limp, that has broken your heart. Few things feel so disruptive as death. Few things. You know, I know that these are all things we wrestle with here as believers in this church. But believer, I want to remind you that in God, there is assurance to be found in the midst of life's upheavals. Whatever your circumstance, your ultimate security rests in God. It's not going anywhere. Moses was coming to taste the sweetness of this doctrine. Whether Moses was acutely aware of it or not, during these verses, we cannot know. They don't tell us how he felt. But regardless, what was actually happening is that Moses was beginning to truly experience this reality in his life as, as he packed his family onto a donkey and left everything to follow God. Moses didn't have every answer, but he had the promises of God to see him through. 
and a clear sense of God's hand and timing guarding his heart as he left his home to embark on a time of uncertainty. And if there is abrupt upheaval in your life at present, I pray that these words I'm about to share with you minister to your heart this morning. And whatever it is that is causing you to fear or feel stress or grief and discomfort or terror or anguish or impatience, may the Word bring you back to giving those worries to God and resting in His sovereignty. The words of Jesus to His followers have been so powerful to Emma and I and so sustaining through many hard times. Jesus says to His followers, and by extension to you and I who believe this morning in Matthew 6, 26 to 34, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. You know, animals don't feed themselves. Animals have no way to cause pollination and crop germination and irrigation or seasons that are required to provide for themselves. God, the great I am, sustains the universe by the word of his power. He feeds them. And Jesus continues, are you not of more value than they? You meaning the one who he has saved by his death on the cross, if you're a believer. The one who God has looked upon in mercy and in love and saved. You who God has given everlasting life to. Who God has given full forgiveness to and the peace in Christ that is not of this world. You know, 1 John 3, 1 reminds us that we are now called sons of God. It says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. That we should be called children of God. Sons and daughters of God. And so we are. And the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Church, we are loved and known by God in a way that the world can't even understand. And the psalmist says his love is so priceless and unfailing that people take refuge in it. Because it is a sure and constant place of refuge for our weary and needy souls in an ever-transient and an ever-changing world. In ever-transient and ever-changing mortal bodies in ever-transient and ever-changing life circumstances, there is a place we can run to and find refuge. And Jesus continues further in Matthew 6 saying, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to your span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your fa heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Believer, this is so important for your life. Assurance is available to us in life's upheavals. But that assurance isn't found in seeking material security first. It isn't found in seeking familial security first even, or even relational security. Jesus commands us today in Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. If you want a life that is truly secure, seek first the kingdom of God and not even death itself will harm you in the grand scheme of things if you're a child of God. It's in, it's in living a Godward life that true assurance in Christ our Savior is found. And in seeking Him first in everything and learning as Paul learned to be content with little and with much in every circumstance. You know, grief is, is agonizing and regret is debilitating. Uncertainty is, of the future is immensely stressful. Christians are only human. We'll all experience these moments. And sometimes this truth that we're learning today is obscured by storm clouds. You know, our pain, the very immediate pressures we face that God appears silent in can feel louder than the promises we have in Christ, but they aren't. They are not. God remains sovereign even in every agony and in every moment. He sees it all and he cares for his children. In little or much, in sorrow or joy, we
we can have assurance that all things work to the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Romans 8, 28. I just love how verse 20 and 21 work so beautifully to remind us of that truth. That, the huge upheavals of li- that in the huge upheavals of life, there is a sovereign God who knows all about our discomforts and uncertainty and simply calls us back to look upon Him, to seek first not material security or career success or relational security, but the kingdom of God and all that we need God will give to us. You know, Moses was seeking the kingdom as he left Midian and God was going to work powerfully through him. Moses had these assurances as he left everything for God And was Moses a fool to leave the security of Midian to follow God? Absolutely not. Let me quote the missionary Jim Elliott who died trying to make contact with with a remote tribe in Ecuador. He said, he is no fool who gives that which he cannot keep to gain, that which he cannot lose. See, Moses, he forsook everything to follow God. And God not only saved Moses by His grace, God used Moses powerfully to advance the purposes of God in this world uh, and to liberate His people out of the bondage of Egypt. What great encouragement we gain from these verses. Moses has been given assurance from God through God's Word to him. He has seen uh, through the circumstances and timing of God this assurance. He has experienced it through times of uncertainty. But lastly for today, in the midst of a peace assurance that he is sovereign over even his enemies. Because in the second half of verse 21, God shows us something important about himself. He tells Moses, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not let the people go. Now, before asking the big question, why God hardens Pharaoh's heart? Let's ask, what does the hardening of Pharaoh's heart tell us about God, first of all? It tells us that God's sovereignty is not an illusion. That God's all-encompassing power extends over even those who are His enemies. You know, the text of Exodus emphasizes that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Sixteen references in Exodus show that God was actively hardening Pharaoh's heart. Only three times is it mentioned in the text after that that Pharaoh hardened his own heart against God. This came after God initiated the hardening. God says, I will harden his heart. I, the sovereign God of all the universe, will harden the heart of Pharaoh. And then we ask the question, why? The text gives us the answer. We go to Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. God says, but for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. That is God speaking to Pharaoh directly. God is saying, Pharaoh, you know that long lineage that you're a part of? I allowed that line to be established. You know that throne of gold that you sit upon? All the gold on earth came from the collisions of neutron stars during the formation of the galaxy that I spoke into existence by the word of my power. I have allowed you to rise to this very position so that through you I would show my power to all the earth. I know through all of this, God remains perfectly just and perfectly wise. Paul reminds us in Romans that the potter has the right over the clay. In Romans 9, 18, we're told God has mercy on whom he has mercy and God hardens whom he hardens, all for his sovereign glory. And in all of that, he remains the just, loving judge of the universe. Any other portrayal of God is in it, that is anything less than an all-knowing, all-powerful God is not the God of Scripture. God is sovereign. And how sovereign is God? Proverbs 16, 33 says, The lot is cast, and its every decision is determined by God. And R.C. Sproul, he said, There's not a single renegade molecule in the universe outside of God's sovereign control. And here's the thing, that is exactly the kind of God we need. Because without God's sovereignty, His promises that the gospel will prevail and that in the end, sin and death and Satan and all evil will be comprehensively defeated are just hopes. Without God's sovereignty, we have no assurance the Great Commission will work, that that our sins are truly forgiven, that that life in Christ will truly be everlasting. No assurance. 
J.I. Packer rightly said, the sovereignty of God and grace gives us our only hope of success in evangelism. If it depended on man to save, none would be saved. And furthermore, when we come to the upheavals in life, it is a sovereign God and a sovereign God alone that will give us blessed assurance. And whilst there is much that could be said regarding the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, the point I want us to see here is that God is able to fully display his power over the enemies of his people. And God does this to ultimately work everything out for good. Just as he did with Joseph, you know, what was meant for evil, God turned for good. Just as he did with his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus. What Satan and sinful men meant for evil, by killing Christ on the cross, God turned for the ultimate good of saving unnumbered billions from sin. And whenever, when we keep Exodus 9, 16 in mind, we know that God's intention behind the hardening of Pharaoh's heart was so that God could show his power, his, his power to Pharaoh. And that through the long drawn out episode of the plagues of Egypt, God's name may be proclaimed in all the earth. God wants a definitive divine showdown to occur between him and Pharaoh that will show the world who really is divine and who really are the sons of God. Because Pharaoh, he was thought by the people to be divine or semi-divine, as, as we noted in previous sermons. Most Egyptians believe Pharaoh was a son of the gods, and that whenever he died, he would be immune from judgment. And he would take the form of Osiris, and he would actually become a judge over those who died. But God wants to make something clear to Pharaoh and to all the world that I think becomes obvious in verses 22 to 23. Because God tells Moses to say, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. And if you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. There is only one God, Yahweh. And Pharaoh was not his son. God says here that Israel was his firstborn son. And in Hebrew culture, to be a firstborn son meant to have a special kind of privileges. It meant to receive the highest priority and preeminence in the family. And how we understand this is like this. When God made his covenant with Abraham, promising to make him into a mighty nation and that through this nation he would bring the Messiah into the world, God was in that moment ascribing a kind of firstborn privilege to the nation of Israel. It would be Israel that would first see the long-promised Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be the line of Israel that God's unique, only begotten Son would step into the world to save the world. And so Israel would be the firstborn among the nations who would first experience this blessing. That's what God means here. But God always had that larger picture in mind that through His true Son, through His unique only begotten Son, Jesus, God would call sons and daughters from every tribe and tongue and nation also. God wanted to make this clear to Pharaoh. He wanted Pharaoh to know that he was not a son of the gods, but he was enslaving a nation of people upon which God had looked upon and chosen to be His instrument to bring about the Messiah who will bless every nation. And therefore, God demands that they be let go. Failure to do so would bring about the plague of the firstborn upon Pharaoh and all Egypt. I know for Moses, all this imagery must have taken years for him to comprehend. But we end off our sermon today at a nice transition point into the table, uh, picking up this theme of sonship. Your hearts can't help but be moved to worship God for not only delivering his people out of the bondage of Egypt and making them into a nation, but above all, we worship God for sending his true son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the darkness of our world, into a manger in Bethlehem, to a world that was in sin and error repining. And through God's only begotten son, there on a hill called Calvary, did he give his life willingly on the cross for us. He died to pay for the sins of all those who would repent and come to faith in him alone for the salvation of their souls. And we're promised if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And to be saved means to experience 
the assurance of sonship. Galatians 4, I've already quoted it. I'll quote the rest of it now. Paul gloriously proclaims this to the believer. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir to God. That is the great hope of every believer today. It is the undergirding assurance that we rest in. That because of Jesus Christ's death on the cross for our sins, we have been saved by God, and now God has sent His, only, His Holy Spirit into our hearts, enabling us to say, Abba, Father. And because now we are adopted sons and daughters of God through the finished work of Christ, we conclude and move to the table and close by saying, whatever upheaval you find in your life right now, allow these realities from God's Word in the life of Moses to give you assurance. That whatever comes our way, nothing can pluck us from God's hand. No situation will ever pull us away from his loving presence. Because our so he's our sovereign God and our Abba Father. Amen. Let me pray before the table.